waiting, watching. Searching and longing. Brood misconceptions. Fostered assumptions. Strange and awkward and insightful. Perceptive, determined. We're going to introduce you all to two folks this morning, and it's very close to the birth narrative, um, who, who are both fantastic and, all, and probably culturally maybe a little um, unexpected or even awkward and weird, Anna and uh, Simeon. But before we get there, let me just mention, it's been said that God hides his work in the natural order under the unnoticeable sequence of events. Uh, Felion's point, the guy who said it, it's not so much that God intends to hide his work, but that because it's embedded into the moments of our days, it's almost imperceptible. We just miss it if we're not paying attention. Now the Lord embeds it and infuses it in our days of alarm clocks and traffic jams and deadlines and, and bills and grocery stores and gas stations and pharmacies dentists, offices, and doctor's appointments, mortgages, and rent payments, and job searches. Our days are filled from sunrise to sunset with the work of God in our lives. But because the work of God is infused in all that unfolds, if we don't pay attention, if we're not watching, it's possible, if not even likely, for us to miss what he's up to. So what we've been talking about as we've been approaching Christmas morning, uh, thinking back to that first Christmas morning, the invitation that our God's given to us is for us to look beyond the details of our days and the events, to look more deeply, to dig further, to notice in the details of our days the hand of God at work and moving and working. We've been talking about the wise men. These were pagans from a distant land, magis from the far east, and, and they saw his star. And they had a pattern of life that watched for this event. And whatever it is they saw, we don't really know for sure what it is. They paid attention to it, and they got curious. And they're pagans, right? And still they got curious about what God was doing. And then they used God's own words to interpret what they were seeing, and that brought them to Jerusalem and, of course, the contrast that we were exposed to last week between God's people and the pagans could not be sharper and more distinct. Matthew exposes for all to see and for all time the difference between Herod and the city dwellers and the religious leaders and the pagan wise men from a distance. Herod, the city dwellers, the religious leaders, none of them, not a single one of them, could pick their eyes up from their navel gazing to see what God was doing five miles away in Bethlehem. None of them could ask, God, what are you doing? What are you up to? Well, we're going to look this morning because it, this, we discovered that not all of Jerusalem was dense and unaware. There at least was two in Jerusalem who was paying attention and was Curious to, to do that, we're going to have to actually rewind the tape by about a year and a half before the wise men show up in town to look what happened. But before we do that, let's enter into a time of prayer. Will you pray with me? Uh, gracious Father, we're thankful for your goodness and grace. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful, uh, Father, that you move and work. And we ask this morning that we might get curious and that we might be able to look beyond to dig deep and do the harder work of seeing your hand in our days. Put words in my mouth as they settle on our hearts, Father. May we be well transformed for your glory and for our good. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, about a year and a half before the wise men show up in town, about a year and a half before that is when Jesus was born, give or take. But let's, take a, let's back up and take a bit of a running start at it. 
We're going to look at a passage in Luke chapter 2, and when this happens, it's been about a week since that first Christmas morning, and you remember the details likely that led up to that morning, from a forced journey of Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, from a frantic search for a place to stay, an inn of some kind or another, from angels filling the sky to announcing their birth to the amazed shepherds coming running and hurtling low fences and searching mangers to find the one. And then for Mary and Joseph, things begin to settle into routine. Things begin to settle into the norm. At least that's certainly what it must have felt like to them. Verse 21, Luke chapter 2, verse 21. If you're reading along, we'd love to have you see that, to see the things that we're seeing. Things seem to settle into the norm for Mary and Joseph as they bring Jesus to do the thing that his people have been doing for thousands of years. They've been circumcising their boys at eight days. Luke chapter 2. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the room, the womb. Circumcision, that was a ritual that God's people had been doing uh, for, for thousands of years. About 2,000 years beforehand, God had entered into this ritual with Abraham. And, but I want you to know it was not religious mumbo jumbo. It was not just the kind of thing that, that religious people did to demonstrate their religious fervor. It, it actually was a sign of something. It was actually a sign of God's promises that he had entered into with Abraham and then all of his people. You can read that story in Genesis 17. Verse 7 says this, though. God speaks to Abram at that point, Abraham. He says, I will establish my covenant before me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God makes a promise with Abraham that I will be your God and you will be my people. We will live together in relationship and in intimacy. We will be a family with one another. I will not leave you. It's an everlasting covenant for all times, forever and ever. We will live together, me with you and you with me. And so that you know I'm serious about this, I'm going to give you a sign of the promise. And that sign was circumcision. And so when Jesus is brought to the temple mount or brought to, for circumcision at eight days, it was a sign of that promise that God had given to his people that we will live together in intimacy and in fellowship, that I will be your God and you will be my people, that God's greatest desire, and I don't think it begins in Genesis 17, but Genesis 17 affirms it. God's greatest desire is to dwell with us forever. Now we could stop here and spend weeks drilling down and teasing out the implications of, of a God who is so deeply in love with his people that he says, I promise to be with you forever. This is probably though the last normal thing that has happened for Mary and Joseph and Jesus that week of birth. They give him an unusual name. Not that Jesus is an unusual name, but it would have been unusual for Mary and Joseph to give that name to their child. The normal practice in the day would have been to give their children a family name. It's not that different in the U.S. perhaps. It's not that different around the world that you would choose a name that would be a family name. But that's not what Mary and Joseph did. They were told separately, Matthew 1 and Luke 1, by angels, both of them tell the stories, of how both of them were approached separately by angels and said, you will name your son Jesus. Jesus is actually the compound word of two Hebrew words that they're squished together to make a name. Yeho, which is the personal name of God, and Shua, which means to liberate or to save. And so literally, they're giving Jesus a name, and this is what his name means. Our personal God has come to save us. Is that not foreshadowing the fulfillment of a promise, not only a, of dwelling together for eternity, if you know the end of the story, but of the work of Jesus Christ as his days unfold? It becomes all the more profound or all the more affirmed if you were to skip forward to verse 30. Uh, Samuel, oh, no, no, Simeon is his name. Simeon will sing a song in a little bit. We're not going to, we'll touch on it a little bit later on this morning. 
But he sings a song, and in that song, in verse 30, he says this. After looking at Jesus, he says, he says my eyes have seen your salvation. And you notice what he's saying. My eyes have seen salvation, not a part of salvation, but all of it. When I look at Jesus, I see that God has come to save his people. I see salvation in totality and fullness in completeness. And it's one of the bedrocks of our faith. It's one of the things that the Gospels are very clear about, that Christ is totally and completely sufficient all by himself to work our salvation, to remove our brokenness, to wash away the darkness that sits in our hearts and our souls, to change everything. That from that moment in the garden where Adam and Eve made a decision and all that has come from that, Jesus can reverse all of that, takes it all away, all by himself, needs no help. As a matter of fact, insists he will get no help because we are no help to him in that First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. This is Paul writing to Timothy, who was, a, who was pastoring the church in Ephesus that Paul had been spent years at. He says this, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. And it's part of the good news of the gospel that our God has brought peace all by himself. That there's nothing that we add to that. There's nothing we can add to that. We don't need to add anything to it. And if we try to, we can't really do that. That Christ has taken care of our sinfulness all by himself. It's one of the it's one of the things that, that can be hard for us to believe, that all we have to do is put our faith in Jesus. We want to work hard, and we want to do good things to then uh, add our work to Christ's work. And our lifestyle is an important thing, but it's important as a reflection of what God has done, that there's an order to it, that God redeems and saves us. He washes away our darkness and takes our brokenness, and then we live our lives out of that. And if we get that order reversed, then we're not paying attention to what our, our God has said to us in Scripture Back in Luke chapter 2, Simeon, or we're told this in verse 22. When the time came for purification, now that again would have been a very normal thing. It would have happened about 40 days after mom and dad would have brought Jesus to be circumcised. So about 40, or after his birth, sorry, about 40 days after his birth, mom and dad bring Jesus to Jerusalem for the purification of Mary and, and the sitting inside of Jesus, the uh, the firstborn son. Again, this would have been a promise. This stretches back in the Old Testament. And while they're there in Jerusalem, when they come to the Temple Mount for this activity, they meet two folks, Simeon and Anna. And, I want to, and, and we want to spend some time looking at how are they similar and what then does that mean for us today. This is what we discover, Luke 2, verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord, the Lord's Christ. Now, Simeon, you fast forward to verse 36, and we, we, we meet Anna. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer day and night. A couple of things they have in common. They're both aged. They're not young, but they have fullness of days. Simeon, we're not really told exactly how old it is. It never officially or full, uh, explicitly states, but the impression is, is he is not young, that he is older Anna, though we're told very specifically how old she is, in verse 36 and verse 37. There are a couple ways to read this verse. Either she is 84 years old, and that'd be one way to read it, or the better, better scholarship argues that she had been married seven years and then was widowed for 84 years. Now, she gets married at 12, which is most likely the age she got married, because that's when young girls would get married in the day. You add the 12 to the 7 to the 84, and you discover Anna is probably 103 years old. Well, they're 84 or 103. Let's all just kind of agree that Anna is not a spring chicken. She's been around for a minute. She's seen a lot. But age is not the only thing they have in common. We discover both Anna and Simeon are watching for the one. They're looking for the anointed one. They're watching for Jesus. 
We're told Anna never left the temple day and night. She was there all the time. Whenever it was open, there was Anna, and with Simeon not far behind. Can you take a minute and picture what that might have looked like on the Temple Mount? Anna, 103, Simeon, maybe not 103, but not young, on the Temple Mount watching and looking, searching for the one to come. They likely stared at every family that stepped on the mount, don't you think? Watch for every mom and dad with a baby who has come. Is that the one? Maybe they would mutter to themselves, is, there's a couple. Maybe that's the couple. Is, is that him? Is that the one? No, that's not him. Maybe it's that one over there. Over and over, day after day, watching and waiting and looking. It's true, isn't it, that generally we find the things we look for and we rarely find the things we don't. They were looking. And as for Simeon and Anna... We have no idea how long. It's possible, right? They had both been given the promise that morning. It could have happened 40 years before when Jesus, or 40 days before when Jesus was born. It could have happened 40 years before. We don't know the time frame. But as you read Luke's gospel, it becomes clear that this is a routine activity for them over and over and over. A promise had been given and they were waiting probably waiting for a long time. It, it occurs to me as we sit here this morning, whether you're on campus or you're at home online, there are some, if not many, who've been waiting too. Maybe you've been praying for a baby or for healing or for help. You're praying for a financial break or a relationship to be healed, a spouse to finally get with it, a promotion, a different job, or one all together, waiting. God has given promises to take care of us and provide for us and wondering, when will that happen or is this what it looks like? Yearning for the day. Reminds me, we aren't the first to wait for God to move and work. Think about King David. King David waited 15 years after being anointed king before he sat on the throne. I think about Abraham. We've talked about him, right? He waited 25 years after the promise of children to actually have one. Think about Israel and Egypt or Israel in the desert. They waited north of 400 years to leave Israel to come into the land for freedom and the land or 40 years in the wilderness waiting for the moment they could cross over the border or God's people in the first century. They had waited for over 400 years since the close of the Old Testament, waiting for God to speak again. Waiting. And when God spoke and the New Testament comes open, what a word he says. John records it this in John 1, 1, 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from, uh, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Simeon and Anna were waiting, just like many of us wait going to the temple day after day, faithfully waiting for the Lord, wondering, is this the day? Is this the one? Is that the Messiah? Can we just be honest? Waiting's hard. <laughs> like, it is difficult. So how do we do it? How do we wait for God? How'd they do it? Eugene Peterson, a pastor of just a season gone by, he offers this. Waiting means there is another whom I trust and from whom I receive. My will finds another will that is greater, wiser, more intelligent than my own. Isn't that cut at the heart? That when we wait, 
The only way we can wait is by beginning in the place that we understand and believe there is a greater, wiser, more intelligent will at play. And I trust him. I trust him. Now, Peter, Peterson goes on. He says this. He says, waiting is a, is a disciplined refusal to act until God acts. So how's that going for you? How does it go for you to wait on the Lord's movement? How, how does that roll for you? Is your life a picture of the disciplined refusal to act, waiting to act until God does? And in Simeon, not only do they look for him, not only do they wait for him, but they look and wait for him at the, at the right spot to find him. They were on the Temple Mount, right? The Temple Mount would have been the center uh, of the, the national hope for the people of Israel. It was in the capital city. It was a spot where God has promised to meet his people. Remember, I will be your God and you will be my people. And coming out of that, uh, the, the, the tabernacle gets built and the temple is fashioned after the tabernacle. And this is the place where God has said, I will meet with my people and so Anna and Simeon go to the Temple Mount because this is the place that I will find God. This is where I will meet with him. As the Old Testament closes, it rolls through the Gospels before Acts chapter 2 and the Spirit coming on. In the New Testament, in, in, those, in the Gospels and before, where else would you look? I'll, I'll give you an example. Fast forward 12 years from Christ's birth. Remember that time that Mary and Joseph go to Jerusalem? They go to Temple. And then they go home, but their traveling party was so large, the family was so big that it was a bit before they discovered that Jesus was still in Jerusalem. He had not come back with them. So they return, as you can imagine, the families would return, his mom and dad return, frantic to find him. There is no cell phone. They won't answer their phone. I pay for their phone. That's not how it worked. Moms and dads, you know the feeling, don't you? Amen. They returned to Jerusalem, frantic to find him. And, and when they defined him, they ask the parent question, don't they? What were you thinking? Do you remember what Jesus said? Luke chapter 2, verse 49. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? See, Jesus understands. This is where we meet with God. Let me ask you, where do you go to find God? Where do you go to find Jesus today? I'm not asking the theological question. I understand that God is everywhere. I understand that in faith, the Spirit fills us. Paul talks in Corinthians about how we are now a temple. Not only does it talk about how we take care of our bodies, but primarily it talks about how we are filled with God, and so we then are a temple, right? And so everywhere we go, God goes, and everywhere we go, God is already there. I understand that theologically. I'm not asking the theological question. I'm asking the functional question. Where do you go to find Jesus? For some, it's silence, isn't it? For others, it's solitude. For some, it's going outside and being part of creation. The trees and the wind, the smells and the sounds draw them into God's presence. For God's people, it's certainly the gathering together, whether it's on campus or online, is a part of that. For me, I geek out on deep dives into study, exploring texts and looking at nuances of words. My heart is refreshed when I study the tense of a verb of all things. I get rejuvenated. Do you know where you go? Where do you go to meet with Jesus and to find him? And when's the last time you went there? Well, not only were they watching and waiting, not only did they go to the right place to find him, one last thing I want you to notice. Watch what they do when they do find him. Verse 29 and verse 38. What does Simeon do? He sings a song. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Anna, verse 38, she doesn't sing, but she works the crowd. 
Anna, and coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. How loud do you think Simeon sang? Do you think it was a whisper? Or do you think he belted it? And can you imagine the excitement in Anna's voice? See, they responded the only way that makes sense. They were overwhelmed, and they couldn't keep quiet about it. Do you know that feeling? Experiencing God, catching your breath, taking it away. You can't help but speak about it. You know, about five days from now, some of us are going to experience that. There'll be some gift that will take your breath away, and it may be something that's in wrapping paper, or it may simply be the experience of being together as a family. And when you return to school, or you step back into the office, what's the first thing out of your mouth? When someone asks about your Christmas morning, ha, the whole family was together, it was glorious. Let me describe it to you. We did this, and this happened, and that, or, ah, oh, that gift I was wanting, oh, it hurt inside me, I received it. The first thing out of the mouth, that's how folks respond to Jesus. You read the Gospels and you look at how they respond to him. The shepherds in the fields. After being in the manger that they told everyone they could find. The, the demoniac and the garrisons. The woman at the well. The deaf man at the, the capolis. And a young man, barely out of pimples. Sitting on a car on a quiet Sunday morning in the heart of Texas. 30 years ago. And for me, so many times since. Is your heart captivated by meeting Jesus? He yearns for you and invites you to look beyond, to go deeper, to dig in. Often the effect when folks encounter Jesus is they can't help but respond. Do you know this Jesus? And do you know Jesus in this way? Let's pray. Our gracious Father, you are good, mighty, glorious, and wonderful. And we celebrate you. Our heart's deepest desire is to be brought into your presence.